Welcome to the EcoThink Podcast, where you join us on a dive into climate change and social justice issues through a STEAM lens. Each episode, we will break down silos, build up amazement, and bring on action. We invite you to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at EcoThink Productions. If you'd like to join the Eco Geeks in supporting this podcast for just a couple of dollars a month, you can do that on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash EcoThink. Now let's get on to the show. Dr. Cherise Dupree is a marine biologist specializing in deep sea ecology and the study of underwater volcanic mountains and hydrothermal vents. In her work with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans here in Canada, she uses remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, to explore the deep ocean with video surveys and sonar. Her work helps Canada to establish marine protected areas, management plans, and effective monitoring strategies. In a recent publication published in 2020, she and her colleagues analyzed how rapid deep ocean deoxygenation and acidification is threatening life on Northeast Pacific seamounts. We are very excited to have Dr. Dupree on the show today to talk to us about her experience as a deep sea marine biologist and the impact of climate change on deep sea ecology. Welcome to the show. Ah, Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so yeah, excited to, to chat with you. Here. Yeah, and we're really excited to talk to you about your work and what you do because it's super important. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you came to be a marine biologist working on deep sea ecology? Well, I've always loved the ocean. I always wanted to be a marine biologist, but uh, just like everyone else who ever went to an aquarium, I wanted to work with dolphins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I was a surfer, a scuba diver, um, and I naturally started taking cameras into the ocean with me to like film my adventures. As I progressed into studying to become a marine biologist, I took that passion of film with me. And now, like as far as the ocean's concerned and what you can film, there is no place more extreme to send a camera than into the deep sea. I bet. Yeah. So. That, that's what it was. It was my love for film and my love for marine biology and the two together uh, took me to the most extreme place on the planet. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love how you say that you started with dolphins, which is like, such a, <laughs> it feels like such a great entry point <laughs> for so many people who love the ocean, but you ended up uh, studying probably one of the coolest areas of the ocean, certainly one of the most mysterious. Mm-hmm. I studied marine biology because I also was fascinated by the deep sea, Mm -hmm. but I started my marine biology journey because I loved anglerfish. (laughs) Not dolphins? Not dolphins, just (laughs) anglerfish. Like the polar opposite. (laughs) I think they're one of the coolest animals on this planet. Your viewers can't see it, but uh, this is my fidget toy. It is. (laughs) What a cute little anglerfish. I've never said those words about an anglerfish, but that's cute. Oh my god, that's so cool. It inspires me. I just uh I just play with it all day long. Yeah, I think I need to buy one for myself. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. So you were able to combine your love of film and your love of the deep sea. And in your work, you make use of video surveys using something called an ROV. Um, which is like a remote operated vehicle, like a robot, right? Um, So you really get to see some of the hardest to reach ecosystems on this entire world. (laughs) What do they even look like, these deep sea ecosystems? What does it look like? We have a, we have a, like a joke in my field where we say, uh, you know, deep sea exploration, it's not rocket science, it's, uh, it's harder. Um, (laughs) So actually, I'd caveat what you said about it being one of the coolest or hardest to see places on the planet and say we actually know more about the surface of the moon and now um, the surface of Mars than we do uh, the bottom of the ocean in the deep sea. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it's actually one of the coolest places in our solar system. Very cool. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, the deep sea is a lot of water for a really long time. Um, (laughs) It looks... It looks black. It yeah. has no natural light in it. And uh, when you're descending with these robots, um, sometimes you see passerbys, you see little alien like jellyfish or lights that go on and off, uh, natural bioluminescence down there. Um, but until you go about, you know, off our coast, three, four kilometers down, and you find the deep sea, the bottom mm-hmm. of it, um, yeah, you're kind of in this like desert of water. Wow. 
and then you hit the sea floor. And uh, okay, the average deep sea sea floor kind of muddy, but uh, not off the coast of British Columbia. Um, we have we have underwater volcanic mountains, we have hydrothermal vents, and there are these places where so much life exists and so much activity is going on. I, I could tell you some some you know familiar sites that uh, that you know of that you could picture, but it's it's down there. So on top of the the sea mounts, it looks like a tropical coral reef. Really? Corals, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, corals, uh, sponges, sharks, octopus, uh, fish, you name it, it's down there uh, existing uh, on these on these sea mounts. That's amazing. Um, wow. Yeah. And then maybe the only thing cooler than that is the, the hydrothermal vent. So you, you get down to a hydrothermal vent, which is like a hot spring, but deep in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks like it's on fire. You can see what you think is black smoke, but it's actually a superheated water gushing out of the sea floor. Mm -hmm. um, it's extreme. It can yeah. be like 400 degrees Celsius in this water. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so you might expect, yeah, you might expect that nothing could possibly live there. Uh, no, it's it's like an intertidal um, beach off of our coast. It's teeming with life. There's crabs, there's worms, there's, um, there's bivalves, uh, so your clams. Uh, it actually has a, a density of life um, very similar to that of a tropical rainforest. Amazing. So, yeah, uh, so I guess to sum it up, what does the deep sea look like? Well, off our coast, it's it's a hotspot of life. That's it's incredible. Wow. Yeah. So, so why is why is it? So you've mentioned a couple of times that off of our coast, it's it's special. Is there a particular reason why the Pacific coast has such a special deep sea environment? There is. It is the same reason why we have earthquakes and mm -hmm. volcanoes uh, along our coastline and our coastal mountain ranges. It's, uh, it's because we have a lot of tectonic activity that mm -hmm. happens just off our, our coastline. And, uh, and that movement of our plates that happens so close to home is what creates the volcanoes. It creates the hydrothermal vents um, and it gives the, the building blocks for these these hot spots of life. For the hydrothermal vents, the 400 degrees Celsius water that's gushing out, is it heated yeah. from the underground magma? Is it magma or lava if it's below the surface? Can't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's called magma. And okay. it's not, yeah, it's not, it is, but indirectly. Um, the magma uh, at, these, at these hot spots in the earth heats up the rock around it and um, at these tectonically active areas, you can think of the sea floor as like very fractured. So water leaks down, goes deep into the rocks and gets to these superheated rock areas that are right next to magma chambers. And, uh, and so the water uh, just, just boils beyond boils because it's under pressure. Um, it dissolves the rock around it and it comes firing back to the surface and shoots out of the sea floor. And where that happens, you actually find life like nowhere else on our planet. Oh. Um, the life there, instead of existing from the sun, it exists by using chemicals from deep within the earth. So um, absent of sunlight, we have life. Amazing. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. And, they, and all of these little organisms, um, they are perfectly adapted to that specific ecosystem. I imagine they wouldn't be able to survive elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, uh, they are. They're called extremophiles, um, but they don't know that. They just think they're animals. <laughs> I just like, have a few friends that are extremophiles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, um, kind of neat because we keep going back to the the you know um, deep sea is like uh, it's like you know other planets. Um, hydrothermal vents, uh, we think, are might be the key to life on other planets in our solar system. And so uh, NASA actually does a lot of investigating with uh, deep sea scientists into how animals live in the deep sea at hydrothermal vents, because there's at least two uh, planetary, planetary bodies mm -hmm. in our solar system where they think there could be hydrothermal vents supported life right now. Really? Oh, yeah. that is so cool. Can yeah. you imagine if we, if like we, 
I, I, I want to be alive when we find that out. Like, I want to, yes. I want to see that. <laughs> yeah. Listen, the life is probably going to be like a tube worm, but it's going to be, yeah, but like, it's cool. going to be rad. That is so cool. <laughs> I've seen, I work with tube worms a lot. Um, we collect them off of Fisherman's Wharf. So, but they're all dock animals. They're closer to the surface. Yeah. yeah. What does the tube worms down below look like in comparison? Right, so your tube worms are probably uh, the feather like, what, 10 worms. centimeters? About, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the giant uh, tube worms that we get at the hydrothermal vents can be four meters. <laughs> yeah, so they're long. They're not, they're not thick. We're not talking about like, um, like beetle juice kind of worms. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah uh, so yes, they're, wow. uh, they're much bigger. They're giants. That's amazing. Maya's worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're fine as pictures and all that kind of stuff, but worms kind of bother me. <laughs> they're just doing their thing. I'll let them do their thing. But man. Yeah. Is this a bit of a trend for the animals that live in the deep sea? Like they just end up way bigger than what we get closer to the surface? Well, I mean, I don't want to speak out of term because I'm speculating here, mm -hmm. but we do have a giant isopod down there that's like uh, the size of a, a vacuum cleaner. Um, <laughs> I guess vacuum cleaners oh. can be all different kinds of sizes, but, yeah. uh, you know, uh, large, uh, like, like a dog, like the size yeah. of a dog. And isopod is like, if you think of a pill bug, that's mm -hmm. an isopod yeah. kind of animal. So you get them, then you get, of course, the, you know, the giant squid. And yeah, it, yeah there are some really big things down that's there. Cool. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we'll touch on it a bit later, but the sure. things down there are really long lived yeah uh, and everything goes really slowly so if you can live a thousand years wow. to, to grow um maybe a little bit bigger than your cousins sure who uh who don't live as long and and are yeah just in a different environment doing a different lifestyle yeah wow so yeah. <laughs> this is this is crazy so many of the people who are probably listening to this podcast they've they've probably never considered the importance of exploring deep sea ecosystems and i think hopefully by now they're like, wow, this is really cool. And like, I can, I can see why it's just cool to see, but there's yeah. also a lot of importance to the work that you do and to learning about these ecosystems. Can you tell us why your work is so important? Yeah. Well, actually it's a good transition because um, it touches on how long animals live down there, how slow it is down there. So um, I'll, I'll start by saying, the deep sea is the biggest ecosystem on our planet. Mm -hmm. So if for no other reason than to know what lives on planet earth, we have to explore mm -hmm. the deep sea. And we've actually, mm -hmm. we've made a dent and explored about 5% of the deep sea. <laughs> so not much of a dent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to say that we know anything about planet earth without doing more exploration in the deep sea is, yeah, it's a little far fetched. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I've kind of alluded to things going slow down there and things being long lived. Um, the deep sea is this incredibly stable environment. It seems extreme to us. It's cold, it's under pressure, it's pitch dark. Who would want to live down there? Well, okay, a lot of animals want to live down there and they live for a really long time because things change on the scale of geological time scales. Like mm. they don't change fast. You think mm. about the intertidal, things change all the time, extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Wet, dry, tide going one way, tide going another way. In the deep sea, it's just being the same. And it yeah. just will be the same. Okay. Until enter humans. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we go into the deep sea to extract food. We do a mm -hmm. lot of fishing in the deep sea. Um, we get oil and gas from the deep sea. And now the new venture into the deep sea is to mine it for, mm -hmm. for metals. Mm -hmm. So these things that we're doing, we're doing fast yeah. and in comparison to the life of an animal in the deep sea we're doing it at like warp speed yeah these animals are not adapted to that kind of change so yeah. that's extreme for these extreme ophiles yeah. that's what they can't adapt to and that's what they can't they can't survive it yeah. um so it's incredibly important for us to go to the biggest ecosystem on our planet and study it because we are already going in there and impacting it in a way that it can't survive mm -hmm. and we need to figure that out before we do something that it's um, going to have an effect all over the planet 
Um, the deep sea is where most of our carbon goes. The open ocean gives us every second breath we take. Um, if you want to say that it gives humans really good services like the food, the metal, the oil, the gas, fine. We need it for so many different reasons. And plus, it's just full of animals that deserve to live. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, it's extremely important for us to study the deep sea and to figure out um, how we can best protect it. Yeah. Well, and as you said earlier, like we've only explored 5%. So, you know, there's so much more to understand. It's almost like saying that you're going to cut down a forest before knowing what's in the forest, you know, like mm -hmm. you might lose something extremely precious. Exactly. You say precious. Um, a marine biologist, uh, every friend and family member I have has asked me, have you watched uh, The Octopus Teacher? People mm. love this Netflix show. <laughs> it is so precious to them this yeah. octopus and uh i mean this octopus lives this amazing life um it uh it cares for its youngs in this phenomenal way and it does so for four months and four months sorry mm -hmm. um it cares for its young uh, in the eggs for four months and i think that really touched a lot of people to really drive home how slow the deep sea goes an octopus the same size very closely related in the deep sea cares for its youngs for four years. Four years? Four years. Whoa. We just discovered that. Yeah, yeah. Sci scientists off the coast of California went back to the same rock for four years and saw the same act uh, sorry, saw the same octopus tending its young every single time it went for four wow. years. Wow. I can't even imagine, like, to care for your young in, in egg form, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. For four years, that's that's amazing. The octopus does not move, yeah, does not eat, oh, just sits wow. there, and it's the last thing it does. Yeah, wow. Yeah. I was gonna ask, like, is it, it does this species also not do anything while caring and protecting its young? Does nothing. Wow, four years. We, yeah, we have it off our coast, and mm -hmm. I've seen them sitting on their eggs before. And uh, I mean, if you can imagine, like. You're a deep sea octopus. You've never seen light before. You've never you've never seen your own tentacles. And suddenly, uh, this this remote controlled vehicle, the size of a minivan, you know, <laughs> drives up to you with its lights and its cameras, and it's like, ooh, an octopus! I'm going to film it. And uh, it it didn't go. It didn't abandon its post. It sat there on its eggs, and uh, and then and then we left. And as far as I know, I mean, that was one year ago. It'll be sitting there for another three years, still on the same rock. Wow. Just yeah. took it all in stride. <laughs> That's such a strange experience for these creatures to have this big ROV come down. I didn't realize they were that large. I didn't realize it was the size of a man. But yeah, that must be such yeah. a strange thing from their perspective. <laughs> yeah, we are the UFO. Yeah. <laughs> these animals. Yeah. 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 That octopus is telling its friends what it saw. <laughs> and they're like, ah, oh, oh, Jane, like... Jane's <laughs> talking about her experience again, like yeah. I swear every, every 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 time, every year. <laughs> <laughs> so you and your colleagues, um, you published a research paper in 2020. Um, and the title of the research paper is Rapid Deep Ocean Deoxid Deoxygenation. I am having trouble with that word. <laughs> and acidification <laughs> is threatening life on Northeast Pacific seamounts. And in this article, you're talking about how these ecosystems are being negatively impacted um, by oxygen depletion, ocean acidification, which are mm -hmm. things that are pretty intertwined with what's going on up here on the surface. So could you tell us a little bit more about these findings? Yeah, so these were pretty alarming findings. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important. It's probably one of the saddest papers I've ever published. Um, it's really important for us to know this, so it's good that we documented it. But um, what it means, uh, I mean, the, the change in oxygen, the change in acidification is incompatible with the life of these animals. We spoke about how long uh, lived they are and how they don't, they don't like change, they nope. don't do change. So um, the drop in oxygen and the acidification changes everything for them. Yeah, it dissolves um, dissolves the food they get. It dissolves uh, the the young that they put out into the ocean to to 
reproduce and, and establish new communities, um, it, it dissolves their actual skeletons. Because mm -hmm. um, a lot of them don't move, so they're just stuck in the water that bathes them. Um, the drop in oxygen makes it so that they, they can't breathe. Yeah. Just, their breath is taken away. Um, so it's, it's incompatible with the life that's down there. And uh, the really important thing that we documented is that this is a long-term uh, trend that is going to be affecting these animals. And so um, we, it's, it's feedback that we need to do everything we can to stop contributing to climate change because all of this is tied to climate change. And then in the meantime, while we're pumping the brakes on this, you know, this monster machine that we've made climate change that's changing the entire world, uh, we have to dial back everything we can control so that uh, we can give these animals some relief from other pressures because maybe they could handle a little bit of change in oxygen if we make sure that we're not also fishing them. Yeah. You know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got to pump the brakes on the climate change as much as we can and then we have to control whatever other impacts we force upon them because that cumulative effect of stressors uh might be the thing that overwhelms them and causes the extinction yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's hugely important and so and you mentioned how it's all tied to climate change and um for people listening can you elaborate a little bit on on how oxygen depletion and ocean acidification are related to what's happening with climate change so i study the animals yeah <laughs> if if i uh if we needed a thorough review of the oceanography i'd probably ask one of my co-authors but i can i can give it a try sure. so um climate change does things like it warms the ocean and uh, if you think about a pot of boiling water on a stove, uh, you can see the bubbles, the, the oxygen being removed from the water. So warmer water means less oxygen in the water. Mm -hmm. So that's one of them. Um, the ocean through climate change is also uh, stabilizing. So instead of having like a really healthy ocean that mixes um, and, and gets replenishment of oxygen, uh, you have an ocean that starts to become stagnant mm -hmm. and uh, the layers that aren't being turned over, the oxygen just becomes more and more depleted. Yeah. Um, so actually off our coast, we have an area, a body of water in the midsection that is naturally low oxygen. Okay. So totally natural isn't alarming at all. Um, it's because the the global conveyor belt of water, the circulation pattern that takes water around the world, uh, it comes up, it ends uh, in part at our coastline. So the water that we're seeing on our coastline hasn't seen the surface for like 10,000 years. So wow. it's, it's starting to run low on oxygen. Yeah. So if, if that's all it was, um, that would be fine because the animals are adapted to extreme conditions. What we're doing by introducing climate change to this already low um, oxygen body of water is we're taking out all the oxygen. Mm -hmm. And that's just incompatible with the life yeah. that needs to, mm -hmm. to live there. So we've made a natural si situation um, far worse um, by, by heating up the water, by stabilizing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. In your paper, um, I'm really interested in how you and your team um, went about recording all of these parameters um, and how did you study the animals and, it, and the effects? Right, so uh, it, was, it was essentially two studies in one. Mm -hmm. Okay, we used uh, the remotely controlled vehicles uh, to study what animals lived where in the ocean so we could establish uh, what the communities looked like, uh, who was there, how long these animals lived for, uh, and parameters about the animals. Um, mm -hmm. Then there's this uh, amazing data set off our coastline. It's 60 years old, and for 60 years, a ship has left Vancouver Island and gone straight out to sea um, to this place called uh, Station Papa. It's far away. I can't actually remember how far it is, but it's a line just straight out to sea. They go um, and along the way, they measure the conditions of the ocean from the, the surface all the way down to the sea floor. And they do this like three, four times a year for 60 years. 
So they have empirical data of what it used to be like, and then over six you know, decades, what it's become, and they can say for certain that we have lost 15% of the oxygen in our ocean, and that the zone that was low oxygen has both uh, expanded, becoming deeper, and becoming shallower. Mm -hmm. And now, so we have that piece of the puzzle, and then they also uh, uh, know the, the ocean acidification, so they can say that that is also, um, that is also changing. And so we know the body of water and we know that it's changed over a, a long amount of time, over 60 years, and that the trend is significant. So we can look into the future um, and putting those two stories together, where the animals live, what water they're being bathed in, and then what it used to be, what it is now, and what it's going to be. Unfortunately, the paper predicts um, extinction events within the next 100 years. Which of the species that you've studied are most at risk? All of them. Um, them? Yeah. <laughs> I figured that was the answer. <laughs> Actually, um, sponges are going to do uh, okay for a little bit longer than um, some of the animals. Um, the, the deep sea fish, uh, they, they're not going to fare so well because they, they're a mobile animal. They swim mm -hmm. around. They, they burn up oxygen. So things that like burn up oxygen need to be able to breathe at a faster rate. So they're being pushed out of their habitats um, and then in the open ocean, they, they mm -hmm. don't fare well. So, um, but I'd say maybe there was going to be a, a, like a loser. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't have the, asked this question. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh. a, it's the deep sea corals mm, because yeah. they're made out of, uh, they're made out of calcium uh, carbonate, calcium carbonate mm -hmm. and that uh, acidic water um, dissolves their skeleton. So, they're getting hit with not being able to breathe. They're not getting their food. They can't reproduce. Mm -hmm. And then their, their exposed skeleton is being dissolved by the, the water that they're just sitting in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's a, that has huge cascading effects because those corals can be meters tall and they're essentially the old growth forests down there that create the habitat for everything else that lives on the seafloor mm -hmm. um, in that community. So, yeah. Yeah, the yeah it's really sad to hear about the really, really terrible impacts that are happening. Yuko, you're yeah. Um, I was going to say, there's two things. Uh, the first thing was, if you want a visual on what ocean acidification is doing to some of these animals, take some vinegar mm. and put a small piece of shell that you pick up from the beach Wait a few minutes and you'll start seeing the vinegar, which is acting as the acid, actually dissolving the, the calcium carbonate from the shells. Yeah. yeah. It's a the, great exercise for kids. <laughs> the, uh, so one of the, the amazing things is that like, you know, life will, I think I'm quoting Jurassic Park, life will find a way. Life will, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Yep. Um, <laughs> Life is, is trying to find a way in the deep sea. So uh, if your shell had a living animal in it, that animal would actually work very hard to try, uh, you know, uh, protect the shell, to, to contribute calcium to it uh, so that it, what was being depleted, what was being dissolved would be made up for. Um, so the animals will try actively fight um, and rebuild or stop the dissolving uh, but of course, in an animal that, you know, doesn't get much food, doesn't have a lot of energy to spare, by stressing it out in that way, um, the animal itself will just perish because mm -hmm. it can't up, it can't keep up with its normal routine, its daily mm -hmm. life, if it's trying to constantly fight uh, being dissolved. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, and and so these animals are, are fighting tooth and nail for their home, as we should as well. And, and something that you do as part of your job is actually you also help to establish uh, marine protected areas. And this yeah. is maybe one of the ways that we can help them out. So could you explain what these places are and why they're so important? Right, uh, so marine protected areas are places in the ocean where certain activities are prohibited mm -hmm. um, and they're harmful activities. And how I was saying that we need to mitigate, we need to dial back everything we can control. That's what we do with marine protected areas. So all the animals inside of it, while we might not be able to control climate change uh, right now, 
um, we can stop fishing, um, bottom trolling, uh, extraction of oil and gases, uh, make sure there's no dumping, make sure there's nothing incompatible with uh, fostering life there. Um, and so, so yes, part of my job is establishing these marine protected areas. Um, working in British Columbia is an amazing place for that um, because we actually do a really good job of it uh, off our coast. Um, Part of the reason is because our deep sea is so awesome. <laughs> uh, the uh, the hydrothermal vents I, we were talking about, the, the hot springs, mm -hmm. they occur in no other Canadian ocean except for off the coast of British wow. Columbia. Oh. Yeah. So how I've seen it's a unique situation. It really is. These things do not usually exist in the, in the waters of a country. They usually exist far offshore. So that Canada has the opportunity, that British Columbia has the opportunity to protect these areas uh, is, is incredibly unique. Um, so in the marine protected areas that we, we have established and that we are currently in the process of accept, establishing, we will protect 100% of Canadian hydrothermal vents uh, in these areas. Awesome. A really That's good number, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yep. And then um, right now we're, <laughs> uh, we're up to 80% of, of the seamounts. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, uh, which is another fantastic uh, milestone mm -hmm. because the only ones that exist outside of marine protected areas are actually so deep uh, that humans have, a, you know, we'd have a hard time impacting them even if we tried. So um, we've got really good coverage of these really special places in the deep sea. That's mm -hmm. good to hear. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Have you gone and studied um, hydrothermal vents and seamounts elsewhere outside of Canada? I have had the fortune to do that. Yeah. Um, so while you're going through school, you get to go uh, abroad and, and do different uh, degrees and postdocs in different places. So I've actually worked uh, in all but one ocean. Um, and that includes uh, up at the like close to the North Pole. Wow. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, the hydrothermal vents I studied uh, were off Tonga and Fiji, which is a great place to do field work. I bet. Yeah. So I have been very, very fortunate to, to go abroad. Um, but yeah, uh, came, came back home uh, because, I mean, there, there is no place like our deep sea on this mm -hmm. planet. So I think it's one of the best places in the world to, to be a deep sea uh, explorer and marine biologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so these marine protected areas and, and the work that they're doing are, and that people protecting them are doing to help these ecosystems is hugely important. But a lot of the people that are listening right now probably aren't really in a position to be involved with the marine protected area directly. Is there ways that you might recommend to help mitigate the impact we're having on deep sea ecosystems just as individuals as as people yeah there there is and i've i've started to play with this idea of like trying to bring it home for people mm -hmm. uh so I'll, I'll give it a shot here but it's really it's a story it's a story in progress so uh, excuse me if i fumble a little bit but <laughs> <laughs> okay so um not during COVID times but during normal times uh we all go for dinners out Mm -hmm. for dinner out at a restaurant yeah. um and just by that act you are affecting the deep sea in in more ways than one and uh you don't have to drive to the deep sea for your dinner that's not how you're affecting it uh you just by just by doing a normal dinner uh you know in in your neighborhood you're affecting it and i'll, I'll tell you how um okay you, you get in your car whether, uh, you know, whether it's a gas car or an electric car that got its electricity from, from burning fossil fuels somewhere else, the way that you get to the restaurant is contributing to climate change. And now we, we understand that climate change is affecting um, the deep sea. So how you choose to get yourself from A to B directly impacts the deep sea. Mm -hmm. um, for a million different reasons, it's good for the planet if we can start to curve um, climate change and the progress of it. So how you move from A to B changes the deep sea. Um, when you get to the restaurant, what you eat affects the, the, the deep sea. So much of our seafood is caught using harmful practices still like bottom contact fishing. So um, reading up on your favorite seafood and making the decision for yourself 
whether it is caught in a sustainable way or whether it's caught using something like bottom trolling or um, a long line that's bottom contact or trap um, and making the decision between uh, having something that impacts the C4 versus something that is more selective. Um, that's, a, that's a huge part of how we affect deep sea. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's mm -hmm. one more. Okay. And it's, it's one that you guys probably wouldn't expect. Um, you're driving to your restaurant, the car you drive and the cell phone you use with a GPS has metals in it that are rare on our planet. One of them is called cobalt. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we are, we are running out of it on land and we don't have an effective way of uh, running a recycling program now. And we, we need to kick that up because where we are turning to is the deep sea for cobalt. And specifically we're turning to seamounts. Mm -hmm. And the plan is to mine seamounts or so hydrothermal vents um, for this rare uh, mineral. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mortality at mining sites will be 100%. Okay. Yeah, that machinery is going to churn up the seafloor. Um, it will be 100% mortality at the mining site. And then the practice actually expands in its impact from there. Um, the, the rock that it kicks up, the sediment that goes uh, in the water is, uh, is expected to travel um, over 100 kilometers. These mining, um, these mining establishments can go on for 20 years at a time. It's something that the deep sea is just not uh, prepared for. Uh, it never will be. Mm -hmm. To do this is going to have a devastating effect uh, on the deep sea. And so um, maybe not having to buy every iPhone that comes up, yeah. maybe skipping a yeah. generation or two, um, maybe, uh, you know, thinking about going to electric cars is great, but then looking into where the company is, is sourcing or going to source um, it's mm -hmm. batteries because those batteries have a lot of cobalt in it. Yeah. So it's technology that's, you know, um, you're, you're, you're driving these green cars, you have the cell phone in your hand, where you choose to buy that technology and how often you choose to change it up uh, actually has an incredibly profound effect on what's going to happen to the deep sea in the coming years. Amazing. Yeah. So, wow. so very direct ways that people yeah. can make sure that they're doing their best to not harmfully impact the deep sea. Like that's, yeah. that's powerful. And that last it's, one in it's, particular. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's vote with your dollar, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's how you get uh, big companies to, to listen. Uh, mm -hmm. It's voting with your dollar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Cause um, I, full disclosure, we just got, an EV for ourselves. And yeah. I did, I didn't know this beforehand. So I'm definitely going to do some research and see where, where my car got its battery from. Um, yeah. Yeah. And regardless of what I find out, we're going to be sticking with this car for a long time to come just to make sure that we don't, you know, have to switch it up too frequently. Yeah. Now the chances are your battery came from land because the deep sea mining is an emerging um, industry still. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So chances are yours did. But it's about creating that demand and, um, and the mining leases around the world have been signed and the companies are poised to go. So this, okay. is, about, this is about to start. Um, when it does, uh, it's, it's going to be huge and it's going to be uh, probably the largest uh, environmental impact we wow. would have ever had on the ocean. Wow. wow. Yeah. I remember looking into deep sea mining a couple of years ago, but when I was looking, they were saying we don't have the technology to send any equipment down there. And yeah. I suppose that has changed now. There have been um, successful uh, expeditions now. Um, mm -hmm. So the technology has got there. The demand for these metals is such that it's now cost effective to do it. And um, we, in the high seas and in uh, nation's own waters. Um, the leases have been signed and, uh, the, yeah, it's, yeah. uh, it's scary close. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have to definitely pay attention to these things as they come up and vote with our dollars. Like you're, yeah, saying. it's, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna come close to home because, uh, for one of the first and largest mining, um, places on the planet, one of the ports where they might land with the material, uh, maybe Vancouver really that yeah. close to home that close to home yeah 
so they've uh, they've done the cost benefit analysis of of where different ports are in the world and Vancouver Vancouver is I think one of the top two for mm. where this material might land. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's scary, and it just goes to show that a lot of these impacts that we're talking about with um, how humans like mine the earth and cause climate change and all this stuff, it's not like it it happened and we're dealing with the after effects. It is happening today, and it will continue yeah. happening for years to come. Still, like we're still in this, right? So I think it's it's important to know that and, and not to despair at it, but to go, okay, there's a lot of work we can do to help mitigate the impact and help fix these issues as they come up. So, yeah. yeah. Do you happen to know which um, large companies are, holds those leases? Or is that not something we can talk about? <laughs> no, no, it's, I mean, it's public information. Uh, so um, there's, there's nations that, uh, that are very invested in this. Um, China, Korea, Russia, Japan um, are the, the major stakeholders when it comes to nations mm -hmm. that have leases to mine the deep sea. Um, interestingly enough, the largest, most devastating mining company in the world is registered here in Canada. Mm. Yeah. This Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't say I'm surprised. Yep. <laughs> We're very <laughs> the primary resource economy still. So yeah. Yeah. We are. So um it's it's a it's a company that um it doesn't it doesn't mine in Canadian waters mm -hmm. and it doesn't have the Canadian government um backing its mining. It um it approaches other nations and gets the rights to to mine the waters of other nations and unfortunately um it's a lot of south pacific nations mm -hmm. that uh you know they didn't know they had hydrothermal vents there uh, it's actually where i did my uh, postdoc i say between fiji and tonga they didn't know they had hydrothermal vents um didn't didn't really care but not because they're not things to care about. It's just if you don't go to the deep sea and explore it, you don't know that they're there. Um, mm -hmm. And then a company comes along and goes, we can help your country uh, with jobs and yeah. with wealth. You have this yeah. material down there. You didn't know existed. Let us extract it. And so this, this, this company will get the rights to, to mine another country's waters. Mm -hmm. um, good news uh, turn of events with that is that now that scientists have gone to those waters and helped, uh, the nation learn more about what's in them is those companies are now pulling back and asking for a moratorium on deep sea mining um, that they don't, not all of them want to mine their waters anymore and they want to go yeah. back. Yeah. 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 That's good. They're taking a stance. That is, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Cause you know, until you know better, yeah. you, know, you can't really do better. Yeah. yeah. Well, and bringing it back a little bit to what we can do as individuals as well. So a couple of the nations that you mentioned, um, specifically Japan and Korea are areas where, and China as well, are areas where a lot of these new electric vehicles, for example, and all of our cell phones <laughs> are made here in Canada. So that directly impacts us as well in terms of how we interact with these products. So even though it, you can say, oh, well, it's, you know, these other nations that are making these decisions, they're making that decision because the yeah. demand for these products mm -hmm. exists in Canada and in other parts of the world. So exactly. keeping that in mind is really, is really key. Yeah. Yeah. No, vote with your dollar. Exactly. And, uh, and there, you know, there's very much discussions about um, recycling programs one day that will, we'll get a closed loop system and we'll recycle those electric batteries. And, but, um, but the pushback is, well, we can't do it just yet. And I don't know, I'd challenge that. And, you know, it, maybe if enough people will be like, it, the recycling needs to start now, not later. We don't need to introduce more metal to the, the circuit. I don't know. There's, there's opportunities there. Are, yeah. yeah, a lot of opportunities there. So speaking of opportunities, nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's, what's next for you? Any projects that are coming up that you'd like to share with us? Uh, actually, uh, there is. Um, so we are heading back out to sea uh, June 15th. Um, we're going to uh, uh, back off the coast to these areas that we are making into marine protected areas. 
Um, and we are going to study Canada's deepest seamounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, gone to the deep ones just yet. We, we looked at ones that were shallow. We looked at Canada's largest uh, seamount. And, uh, and now we're going to go explore um, the deepest parts of our oceans on these volcanoes to make sure that we, we fully understand the life down there and the unique aspects uh, of it to, to better protect it. That's amazing. The That's deep so ones. exciting. <gasps> so cool. And so are these, these are places that have never been seen before. Oh, yeah. That's uh, every time we turn on the lights, it's places we haven't seen before and animals new to science. That's our <laughs> How can, how can say my, how can my dad keep up with new research like this? Oh, that's, that's <laughs> great. Okay, well, so we always hashtag our expeditions. Um, so this one is going to be Pacific Seamounts 2019. Um, so if your dad can follow our hashtag. Um, <laughs> yes. We also, we do lots of media events before we head out to sea. Um, so if you get your news from uh, newspapers, um, from TV, from radios, you'll usually hear about the Pacific Seamounts Expedition. Um, and we've, we've done, a, you know, three, four years of this now, other than the COVID year. Um, we go out in the summer. Um, this year is kind of cool because we are partnering again with Ocean Networks Canada. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be helping us do uh, sort of like a a faux news situation where we'll be streaming from the deep sea live because we do that. Yeah. Uh, you see it, you can see it when I see it um, yeah. from any computer or cell phone on the planet. Um, you can chat to us too. And Oceans Network, uh, Ocean Networks Canada is going to facilitate that live interaction. Um, and because we're going a little bit earlier this year, um, we're going to try get into as many schools as we can because uh, school will still be in session. Um, so, okay, your dad probably doesn't go to school anymore, but <laughs> if he has a cell phone or a computer, um, he can chat with us scientists uh, as we explore the deep sea live and he can see everything, everything we see. That's so Perfect. Cool. He does, he's starting the social media <laughs> trend, so this will be great. <laughs> Fantastic. So how long, how long is this expedition going to be? Is it going to be for the whole summer? No, no, no. Um, this expedition is going to be two weeks. Okay. And we'll, yeah, we'll dive every day, um, usually, usually during the daytime, uh, because we run 24-hour operations on the ship, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have oceanography uh, surveying going on at night. Um, so almost every day for, for two weeks, uh, we'll be exploring Canada's deepest seamounts. That's amazing. That's so exciting. Yeah. yeah, I can't wait to see what's down there. Probably lots of angle, angle, old guys. Yeah, yeah. Little angle. Oh, <laughs> nobody can see that I just held up my little toy of a deep sea fish. Your little angler fish friend. Yeah, I, I'm gonna get one for myself. That's a great <laughs> fidget toy. <laughs> I, I actually got an entire set. You can get um, deep sea, deep sea toys, and so I have a whole bunch of. I have a dragon fish, and I just love that. You know, deep sea is. I don't know, not being normalized, but it's being brought into to people's homes at, at such a mm -hmm. young age that you could actually get toys of deep sea animals. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've been trying <laughs> to get my younger sister into the deep sea world and showing her all of the cool but weird creatures. Yeah. yeah. yeah she still likes the charismatic land creatures more, but it's okay. <laughs> She'll get there. <laughs> She'll get there. <laughs> so you shared with us, um, Ocean Networks Canada will be sharing this expedition and it, people can tune in with the hashtag. And we'll make sure that all of that's linked below in the show notes for this episode. So make sure to check that out if you're interested. Um, is there any other way that people can keep up with you and your work online? Uh, I'm on every social media platform just under my name, uh, <laughs> Dr. Sharice Dupree. And uh, yeah, I do, uh, I do a fair bit online. So, uh, and I, I lead these expeditions. So if you're following me, you'll get a healthy dose of deep sea on the daily. <laughs> that's another way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Amazing. Yeah, we'll make sure to put that below as well. So definitely yeah. make sure to follow Cherise in her work. Um, thank you so much for coming. This was a really uh, great conversation. That was a blast. Yeah. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, it's outreach, uh, communicating science is such an important pillar of the work. Uh, 
I, yeah. I can't remember who said it, but you know, uh, the science isn't done until it's communicated. So, mm, so true. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having me on and letting me do that, you know, final stage of the science, which is getting it, getting it to where it needs to be for the people. Yeah, no, thank you so much again. And thank you for making the time. And I, I know I, for one, will be watching some of those live streams. And yes, <laughs> fantastic. Make yeah. sure you say hi. I will. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. well. Yeah. Awesome. All right. We will see all, well, I guess you'll hear us next week at our mm-hmm. next episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the EcoThink Podcast. We hope you enjoyed learning something with us today. EcoThink Podcast is an official product of EcoThink Productions. You can find past episodes, transcripts, and show notes on ecothinkproductions.com forward slash podcast. You can support us by following us on Instagram and Twitter at EcoThink Productions and join the Patreon on patreon.com forward slash EcoThink. See you next week.